Welcome, everybody. Today's Holocaust Memorial event is made possible thanks to the Bennett Foundation of the Bennett Center, the uh, Jewish Federation of Greater Fairfield, and Campus Ministries, I think, in a, in a really great uh, alliance. My hope as director of the Bennett Center is that today's event will help forward the cause of coexistence in this polarized time when we so often forget about our common humanity. So first, I think I should address the elephant in the room. You know, there's so much uh, death and destruction going on in the Middle East, in Gaza. The most intelligent thing I read about this recently was by the Israeli writer Etgar Keret. So I'd like to share this with you before we begin. A couple of weeks ago, he writes, I watched the Egyptian-American comic Rami Youssef's opening monologue of Saturday Night Live. Towards the end, he talked of praying for God to stop the violence and free the people of Palestine, and the audience responded with raucous applause. As a world-weary Israeli, I diagnosed the enthusiastic crowd as liberal pro-Palestinian New Yorkers, but a second later... Youssef said he was also praying for all the hostages to be freed, meaning the Israeli hostages, and was met with an equally loud applause. That was when I understood that unlike my social media feeds, where there is a clear-cut split between Israel lovers and Israel haters, the rest of humanity is mostly very human. When it sees a panicked young Israeli woman being dragged into Gaza, it wants her to be released when it sees a hungry Palestinian family huddled under a makeshift tent, mourning its dead, it wants their suffering to stop. Yes, I know, a lot of people will now jump up to explain that you can't compare Palestinian suffering to Israeli suffering, or Israeli suffering to Palestinian suffering, and that one side is to blame, while the other side was simply left with no choice, But beyond all the explanations and reasonings, however impassioned, there remains one basic truth. Suffering is suffering. And it's only human to want it to end as soon as possible. Today, as we contemplate the suffering that preceded the destruction of European Jewry, the murder of six million Jews and numerous others, let us mourn But let us also be inspired, for in the Warsaw Ghetto, as we're about to learn from our distinguished speakers, under the shadow of death, the historian Emanuel Ringelblum had an idea. He would create an archive of creativity, a testament to the spirit of humans living under the most dire extreme circumstances, and yet daring to write, to create, to commemorate, and to enhance their own humanity. We'll hear about this spectacular archive shortly, but first I'd like to call up Father Keith to offer a prayer. Let us pray. Compassionate God, on this most solemn of occasions, we open our hearts, minds, and souls to you. As we remember the six million, the 11 million, the indifference and the evil. As we honor the heroes, the martyrs, the survivors, and the victims, we ask you to soothe our souls, to amplify our memories, to strengthen our resolve, and to hear our prayers. In the presence of eyes which witnessed the slaughter, which saw the oppression the heart could not bear, and has witnessed the heart that once taught compassion, until the days came to pass that crushed human feeling. I have taken an oath to remember it all, to remember not once to forget. Forget not one thing to the last generation, when degradation shall cease to the last to its ending, when the rod of instruction shall have come to conclusion. An oath, not in vain passed over the night of terror. An oath, no morning shall see me at flesh pots again. An oath. Less from this we learn nothing. To the six million, 80 some years ago, you were swept up by the whirlwind. Yet always we remember you. 
and today we mourn. We mourn how you were stolen from us and how your lives were stolen from you. We mourn what you were, were destined to become, writers, scientists, politicians, and composers, parents, teachers, agitators, defenders, champions of the Jewish people. As we light these candles, we remember you. We honor your lives and your good deeds. We sanctify your good names. We light six candles and we bless your memory. Anima ami, anima ami, anima ami. Bemuna shlema, It's now my honor to introduce our speakers who are here all the way from Warsaw, Poland, where they've been involved in an incredible project that just, just reached its uh, fruition. In the Warsaw Ghetto, under the shadow of death, the historian Emanuel Ringelblum urged everyone to begin to write. Diaries, testimonies, poetry, fiction, anything that would help bear witness to the unfolding tragedy. 35,000 documents were written and buried in milk cans, then recovered after the war, and have now been transcribed and published by the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw in 36 volumes. Monica Kravchik and Dr. Lena Bergman are representatives from the Jewish Historical Institute, and they're with us today to describe the archive and all the work that they've been doing on this crucial project, testament to human creativity in the worst possible circumstances during the Holocaust. So first I'd like to introduce Monica Kravchik and then Lena, please. Good evening, dear uh, Fairfield University students and of course staff, reverends, professors, uh, distinguished guests, uh, it's uh, really a great honor and pleasure, of course, to be here representing country where much of the atrocities that are described as the Holocaust happened. Um, what happened against Jewish people 80 plus, 81, 80 something years ago. And those crimes, crimes were masterminded by German Third Reich, the Nazi state, uh, which policy became to eliminate Jewish population from the face of Europe. Wherever they came, they saw destruction and death and persecuted anyone who had these huma human feelings toward uh, fellow citizens. In Poland, uh, the Second World War started in September 1939, and Germans started occupation by persecution of intellectuals and the intellectual elites in the whole population, both Polish and uh, bo both Catholics and Jewish Poles. That's what we would like to say. Uh, because the Second World War is much greater phenomenon that includes Holocaust as a very specific subject, but we should remember that it 
touched and influenced and uh, affected human lives in um, actually in the whole Europe and also uh, reached America as well as the American soldiers were fighting and bringing freedom also to people who were kept in the um, German concentration camps in the western part of Europe especially. However, the persecution of Jewish population gradually worsened and until they were closed behind the actual brick walls in many ghettos, many closed districts all throughout Poland, as we focus on our country today. Um, and especially in Warsaw, where this story happened that we would like to tell you today, uh, this is where it starts. And we are going to talk about one man who changed the, our perception and what we understand as Holocaust studies today. Without his contribution, it would not be possible at all. Um, the group um, adopted the nickname Onek Shabbat. Um, that, uh, that, that means the, the joy of the seventh day of Shabbat, of the rest day. This was the nickname because uh, they were um, working as the clandestine operation. The, nobody could know about it because this was all illegal what they planned to do. What they planned to do was um, to collect information and write it down. Uh, the leader of the group was uh, Emanuel Ringelblum. He was a historian, teacher, social activist. He was middle aged um, teacher in a school. He also had academic career. We would, uh, we might think that it could have been anyone of us here. Uh, and it always takes uh, very specific moments of history when actually people are trigger, triggered for leadership and they pursue the higher calling, as we can think of it now. Um, the group was uh, completed of, uh, was uh, gradually growing, reached the number of about 70 people, very diverse. We know only 37 by name. Um, just showing you a few pictures that survived, uh, including the, you can see the, the, the families, the faces, people from various walks of life. There's a writer, Gustava Jarecka, who was a novelist. There is a, a rabbi, Shimon Huberband, who wrote about destruction of uh, cultural Jewish life, others. This is the list. I just have 10 minutes, as I was <laughs> reminded. So I'm just giving you very brief information. But you can find all of this uh, in our website of the Jewish Historical Institute if you want to type it. There is a lot of information. And I'm sure that there is lots of those stories are also available through other resources. So we can, we can see the names, we can see some of the things they did. They were real people, but they were in a way average people. But on the other hand, they were excluded even from their possibilities of daily work because the places where they used to work before the war were liquidated. If they were high school teachers, the schools were not allowed. If they were journalists, basically, all uh, newspapers were banned. They were only some, some, some newspapers that was allowed by the Germans to spreading their pro propaganda and their information. In the last row, you can see people whose name are Israel Liechtenstein, David Graber, and Nahum Grzywacz. They hid the documentation that the group collected. Um, and uh, the secretary of the group, in the one of the last efforts of his writing the story of the also themselves, he wrote the list of people, so we have those names. 
what they did, they collected huge volume of documentation. At first, they thought they would be just registering daily life under German occupation of, of Warsaw. But in the end, they, they realized that they, what they are doing is to record the genocide that is happening throughout the lands that were uh, the, wherever Germans went with their I Nazi ideology. And uh, they, they got some information about uh, massive mass murders in many sites that, uh, that, that were um, created specially or by what is known today as Holocaust by bullets in the Eastern territories when Germany decided to attack Soviet Union. Uh, and also they learned about uh, uh, German killing centers that were established in Treblinka, Beuzhets, Sobibur. Uh, if you happen to be in Poland, it's also one of the places, some of the places are available to see. And it's interesting to get first-hand information. What they collected, there were some documents that were about just daily life. One, one of the uh, one of uh, people who, who was involved in this uh, in this uh, effort, his name was Perez Opoczyński. He was working as the postman in the within the ghetto, and he collected some of the material that people gave him, like, oh, this is my the card from uh, postcard from my family. They are worried, and but they are also telling us what happened in the smaller cities, smaller ghettos that were occupied and in the end of the day, all of them were deported from the vicinity of Warsaw to Warsaw Ghetto, which was the very big and central central location. And uh, from them, from Warsaw, they were all deported to Treblinka death camp. Um, so those documents survived because um, they were aware of what it how the collection should look to represent the, the perspective of the victims. And they collected, they made assignments of work. They commissioned pictures to be taken or collected them. You can see this is the only uh, picture that is showing how the smuggling went through, uh, through the walls of food. Um, daily life still in the ghetto, the life goes on and it has, it has own rights. Uh, how the streets looked like, what were the conditions of life. Now, if, if we ask this deeper question, why they did it, of course, the, they were trying to, to record and to analyze also what's going on. They tried to alarm the world the reports were sent thanks to the cooperation with uh, Polish conspiration to the to the to London. They reached London. The Allies knew. They got these full reports. Uh, one of the couriers, his name was was Jan Karski. He even managed to reach uh, President Roosevelt at the time, and. Uh, told him what was going on in occupied Europe, what was going on in the, in the ghettos, what was happening to Jewish population. And he was the emissary of the Polish government that was working on exile in London. So from London, they sent him through the, uh, via the, the ocean to America to deliver this message. Um, the Documentation was hidden before the whole destruction happened. And when it was hidden only after the war, um, it turned out that only three people from the group survived. Among them was uh, Rachel Auerbach, who um, in the 50s emigrated to Israel and established the archive of Yad Vashem. But so she carried this idea of how important it is to collect documentation and records. And she was campaigning for a few years that the collection of those 35,000 documents hidden 
should they should be recovered. But how to recover it when you have the sea of ruins? There is no more Warsaw in 1945. It's just sea of ruins. If you watch the watch the news on TV and you see today the the um, pictures, uh, photos, broadcasts from from um, Ukraine, and you saw the spirals of rub rubbles in Mariupol or other locations. So this was something similar, except Warsaw was a was a um, city of half million people, and it had two uprisings. First of all, there was a uprising in the in the ghetto in 1943, and then a year later there was another uprising on the Polish side. And the Germans, the methodology that the Germans em employed was the same in both locations. They just blew away all the buildings, set them on fire. Here we are, where is the, where is the treasure hidden, asks Rachela Auerbach in the, in the publication that she published. Um, it was fortunately recovered in two, um, uh, on, on two occasions, in 1946 and the second one in 1950. All this documentation uh, was uh, damaged for many years because Poland was, let's say, behind, close behind the Iron Curtain. Like nobody really cared what, what those documents are about. The Jewish Historical Institute existed uh, since 1947, but it was always underfinanced, and this could not be really, the work could not be done on these documentations. Now, these documents are so important because they, they give perspective of Jewish people. It, otherwise, the information and the accounts we would have only from the perpetrators of the of uh, German soldiers and authorities, some official documentation, and maybe we would have some information from the bystanders, from the Polish population. But they were not in the ghetto; they could not get there. You one would have need to have a special permit to to come inside. The so the the access to the in, to this data was quite limited. That's why it is so important that this documentation, this collection survived, and it served a purpose of, first of all, um, Rachela Auerbach, you can see her here on the picture. Uh, she's, as she was testifying as witness in the Eichmann trial, but the, these documents were used also in the trials of, of other German Nazi war criminals. This documentation is listed on the UNESCO list of, of memory of the world, which is listing all the most important documentations. So, um, documents that exist that were produced by, by human, uh, human race, I would say. Um, okay, and it is available to be seen and it is available to be read. We have completed the Polish edition, and uh, my distinguished colleague, Dr. Leonora Bergman, will speak about, uh, and she was involved in putting the, translating and publishing it in 36 uh, plus, because there are some additional volumes. And, uh, mm, and now we are working on English translation. Most of those documents were written in Yiddish, Second language group is Polish, and then there are some other languages, of course, German and other uh, Hebrew, of course. Um, so it's a tremendous work to be done, and uh, if we might see about, uh, well, what is positive coming out of all these very painful pages is that there is still work for students and researchers to work on it and uh, get into more of this story. So that's what you can see also in Warsaw, in the Jewish Historical Institute. And I really want to thank you for your attention.
So before I introduce our next speaker, I want to make sure we're all on the same page and that we recognize the importance of this day. Um, the normal Holocaust Remembrance Day fell outside of our semester. But today really commemorates uh, an extraordinarily important event, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. It's technically 2 o'clock in the morning, so tomorrow, but uh, we can't do it on Friday, so here we are. Um, now, what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was another kind of triumph of the human spirit, but in a very different way. Um, you should know, just so we're all on the same page, that um, the Germans in these areas, unlike Eastern Poland, the Soviet zone, where they just um, had short-term ghettos and, and just lined up people and shot them over pits, um, open-air killings. In these areas, they, they created long-term ghettos. The Warsaw Ghetto was the largest one, so around 400,000. And of course, it fluctuated a lot. In 1942, in July, they began, the Germans began to deport the residents of the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka, which you may have heard of. It was not even really a concentration camp. It was just a death camp with 13 gas chambers, um, no real labor going on other than, you know, incinerating corpses. And uh, that's where most of the Warsaw Ghetto was deported to. And throughout this agonizing period, Ringelblum and his team are writing. But in, on this day, you know, many, many years ago, um, the, uh, the remaining residents of the Warsaw Ghetto in um, 43 rose up and they fought the Germans who had come to deport the last of them. They fought them with, with pistols, some which, which, were, which were acquired by their Polish um, friends, colleagues on the Aryan side. They fought them with Molotov cocktails, and they actually had a degree of success in holding off the Germans and postponing deportations. It was very, very important to acknowledge this day, but equally important, I would say, is to acknowledge not just those who were willing to fight, but those who were willing to write. You know, it's a very different kind of resistance, but in a lot of ways, it's even more lasting and enduring. And this is why this archive is so important. Now you have six volumes in English that you can access. It kind of, it, it gives the victims agency. You know, it really shows us who they are as humans and as courageous humans who are starving, who are probably ill and uh, under terror, constant terror of death, who are just writing and writing and writing. So that's, that's the, the thing that we really wanted to emphasize today, is um, writing in addition to fighting. Sounded good. Um, so uh, our next speaker is going to continue to tell us about this, uh, this archive. Lennon Bergman has a distinguished career as a researcher at the Jewish Historical Institute. I've, met, I've read much of her research. A lot of it is mapping. A lot of it is just finding in the archives where buildings and synagogues were, where the boundaries known as the Erev was, uh, to pre-Holocaust pre Jewish life in Poland. And then, of course, the very important work of documenting the Warsaw Ghetto and other places in terms of place and space. So that's really been Lena's major contribution, in addition, of course, to all of her work on the Ringelblum archive. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lena Bergman. Thank you very much, um, Glenn, for the introduction. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, thank you for making me part of this event. Um, and thank you, Monica, for introducing uh, the subject in such a broad uh, way. Um, some things will be in a way repeated, but I hope uh, they will be shown also from some other angle. <laughs> um, it is very moving um, uh, that the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is commemorating by this university community. Uh, as Emanuel Ringelblom wrote almost exactly 80 years ago, uh, it deserves to be remembered forever. And the words I quote in the title of my talk, 
he referred to his essays on Jewish writers and journalists murdered by the Nazi Germans. But these words capture his entire project, the underground archive of the Warsaw Ghetto, known as the Ringelblum Archive. It shows how much a handful of people could do despite terrible conditions to testify not only to destruction, but to the life and culture of people who perished. Ringelblum, born in 1900, belonged to the first generation of professionally trained Jewish historians for whom researching and writing history of the Jewish people was also a social and political obligation. He was faithful to the same method, whether he wrote about the Jews in the 18th century or in 20th century occupied Poland. And I quote, to gather as much as possible of the source material, to avoid one-sided interpretation, to add the knowledge of political, economic, and social situation. He was a faithful member of Left Palaitzion, which was a socialist Zionist party, and believed in Jewish future in Poland. And at the same time, uh, was supportive for Zionist youth who prepared for life in Palestine. Although he was, uh, leftist and atheist, he nevertheless did not forget the tradition and started his book on Polish-Jewish relations with declaration of being like a cipher, scribe of a Torah scroll, who knows that the smallest error will invalidate the entire work. He was the only historian in the group of people he re recruited, sort of, to document the life and death of the Jews in the Nazi and Soviet-occupied Poland. They met on Saturday and adopted the code name for their project that sounded so natural, Oynek Shabbos. Monika pronounced it Oynek Shabbat, but we think that they pronounce it Oynek Shabbos, which means Sabbat joy, as fulfillment of a religious duty. The membership included representatives from the entire spectrum of pre-war Jewish intellectual life, Zionists from left to right, socialists, at least one communist, some petty bourgeois merchants, and two Hasidic rabbis. The oldest member was born in 1881 the youngest in 1920. Ringelblum's closest collaborators uh, were the educator Eliyahu Gutkowski and the lawyer, economist, and social worker Hirschwasser. But it also included uh, the lawyer and the com uh, economist uh, Menachem Linder, the teacher Israel Liechtenstein, and Itzhak Gitterman, director of the Polish branch of uh, Jewish uh, Distribution Committee. The world-renowned educator Janusz Korczak was an associate. One of the rabbis mentioned uh, was Simon Huberband. He wrote extensively on destruction of Jewish religious institutions, ritual objects, synagogues, cemeteries, on every aspect of Jewish religious life in the Nazi-occupied Poland. Uh, now a few words of recollection, and I know Monika said already some of it, but I want to recall that, that um, before the 1st September 39, Poland was home to three and a half million Jews, the second largest Jewish community in the world. About one in 10 of them lived in Warsaw, the second only to New York as a center of Jewish culture. Starting in the spring of 1940, 
German authorities began to cut off the future ghetto from the rest of the city with a 10 foot high brick wall. It was finally closed on November 16, 1940. Some 360,000 people were crowded into an area of a little over one square mile. One third of the city's population in less than 5% of its area. Over the next year and a half, over 96,000 ghetto inmates died of hunger and disease, but forced deportations of Jews from surrounding towns kept the overall population number about the same. Then, during the two summer months of 1942, the Germans deported close to 272,000 people to their death at Treblinka. When the Germans moved to deport the remaining population in April 1943, the Jews rose up to oppose them. The uprising was brutally crushed. The ghetto area left as a sea of ruins. Warsaw remaining Jews were transported to the forced labor camps in the Lublin area and murdered in November 1943. And as Monica has shown you already that um, this archive I'm going to talk about was found among those ruins. The team of, we don't know, maybe 60, maybe 50, maybe 70 people, we don't know all their names, as you know already. They recorded and collected official documents, both of the German authorities and the Jewish government, the Judenrat. Uh, ration, food ration cards, work certificates, identity cards, tram tickets, and so on and so on. Um, periodicals, um, invitations to cultural events, periodicals of uh, Warsaw Ghetto Underground Press. There were over 50 of them uh, published, well, published, uh, yes, published and distributed, of course, in a clandestine way uh, in the ghetto. And there were also periodicals smuggled from the other side of the world. Um, the Oynek Shabbos people wrote their own texts and copied other people's texts, raised funds, and helped with other organizational tasks. And by the way, the leadership of the team met in the main Judaic library of the Great Synagogue, which is now the Jewish Historical Institute, where I had honored to work for over 30 years. The group uh, did not limit their activity to collecting existing materials. It recorded testimonies of Polish Jewish soldiers who fought in September 39, and accounts of those Jews who had fled to the Soviet Union. That they developed questionnaires and conducted sociological studies. They organized literary contests for children and adults. They collected testimonies from those forced to resettle in Warsaw and from refugees who had fled there. In all, some 400 accounts were recorded on conditions of Jewish life in towns and other ghettos under the shadow of death. Each one was different and each one was part of national catastrophe. Um, for example, um, here is a story from Inowrocław. The Jewish community was not a big one. 45 families, 
half of them long established and half of them not so. One of the persons at the head was a lawyer, Dr. Leopold Levy. The unknown author told the Oynek Chavez associate about his death, and I quote, he was arrested by a surgeon. Levy told him, you have no right to arrest me. Only a staff officer has the right to arrest me because Levy was a holder of a military rank awarded by the emperor. The other responded, silence Jew or you'll be shot. Levy, you have no right to shoot me, to shoot me. I can do it myself. The other, give him the revolver. Come on, do it. And he did it. And the, uh, this uh, testimony continues. In life, he said he would not leave his community and he stayed. The community was destroyed. Some were killed. The rest had to leave the town. And then the story continues. Some died on the way. The expulsion march went through various towns. The refugees and exiles experienced the most terrible and tragic events on their wandering. But in the small shtetls, they found warm, brotherly Jewish hearts, and sometimes also help from the Polish population. The Oynek Shabbos research included demography, living conditions, economy, social help, just every, every aspect of life. It was probably uh, the, their works on um, situation and role of women was probably one of the pioneering works in what is now called the gender studies. Um, topics like social stratification in the ghetto, corruption, prostitution, the moralization of the youth, nothing was avoided. The material meticulously, meticulously documents the often painful relations among various Jewish groups, the Judenrat and Jewish police versus the general population, the local Varsovians versus refugees and expellees. There was also ghetto folklore recorded, its specific poetry, songs and jokes were also included. Just one joke as an example. Uh, a teacher asks Moshe, what would you like to become if you were Hitler's son? Moshe replies, an orphan. <laughs> Without the archive, uh, we would know far less about what happened to Poland's Jews, little about what they knew and thought about it as it was happening, and almost nothing about how they fought to survive, both physically and spiritually. The extraordinary thing about the archive is that the records were unfiltered by memory, by other sources, or by the hand of later research. We can even learn what people were feeling when they knew they were going to die. Róża Kapłan, in a small town of Krośniewice, wrote to her husband Szmul in the Warsaw Ghetto. And I am going to quote some pieces of her letters. 22nd January 42. I cry for days on end. I feel so sorry for my children. Why did I have them? 24th January. It is horrible that we know in advance what awaits us. It is better to be ignorant. When you do not expect this, you think that you will cope 
even when you are being deported. 30th January. If times were normal, our hearts would swell with pride on account of us having three such men for sons. I pray to God for days on end to spare our life. This is the only thing we desire. Her last preserved letter was of 22nd February. Jews of Krasniewice perished in Helmno, or Kulmhof, in March 42. And here you see uh, the picture and some um, testimonies of a man thanks to whom we know what happened in Helmno. Ringelblom died two years later. He was hiding with his wife, Yehudit, and son, Uri, in a shelter built by the Polish Catholic family, Wolski, at the then outskirts of Warsaw. There were over 30 other refugees from the ghetto in the shelter. One of them, Marek Passenstein, added his letters to those written by the Ringelblums, and they were also preserved. While working on the edition of these letters, I realized that Passenstein's younger brother, who survived in hiding in other places and became one of the leading Polish journalists, always treated me like a family. Interviewing him made me feel so very close to those people from the shelter who were killed in early March 44, together with their Polish hosts. Only three people of the Oynes Szabes group survived. One of them, as you know already, was Hirsch Wasser, who was the only person in the world who knew where the archive was hidden. If the members of Oynek Shabbos had survived, they would have treated much of the material as raw material, notes, outlines. We were not given the option of choosing what to include and what to omit. Our publication of the entire archive in its Polish edition is now completed. You have seen it. Our team of editors and translators was much bigger than Oynek Shabbos group, about 100 people. Ringelblom was hopeful that the hidden materials would survive, be found, and ultimately be made known to the world. We are very privileged to be able to participate in making those wishes a reality. It was and still is our duty, our sacred duty. The publication of the English edition is in progress. One of the Jewish sages living 2000 years ago, Rabbi Tarfon wrote, there is a lot of work it is not your duty to finish the work, but neither are you at liberty to neglect it. Thank you. <laughs> A Vilna-born poet, Hirsch Glick, escaped and he joined the partisans. And it was the time of that heroic uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto that Glick was inspired to write a song. It became the official hymn for the Jewish partisans. The melody actually came from the Trek Cossacks that uh, was familiar for many. It was a march. Say that you are on your final road Though overhead dark skies with late made death for bode 
the long-awaited hour surely drawing near. With a roar, our steps will thunder, we are here. Never say that you are on your final road. Overhead, dark skies of lead made death for bold. Long awaited hours surely drawing near. When the roar our steps will thunder, we are here. From the land of palm tree to the far off land of snow. Our people come together, crushed by pain and woe. Where a drop of our blood has touched the ground. There our strength and our courage will resound. The song is written down with blood and not with lead. The birds don't sing for their ears filled with dread. The song is sung as all the bullets spray. The walls collapse as people heard grenades. Never say that you are on your final road. Overhead, dark skies of lead made death for bold. The long awaited hours surely drawing near. With a roar, our steps will thunder. We are here. Not only did Jews die caught in the eddies and swirls of the Holocaust. Millions of Poles and Roma, Russians and other Europeans, homosexuals and disabled, also ended their lives as victims of Nazism's diabolically efficient technology of death. Martin Niemöller, a pastor in the German Confessing Church, spent eight and a half years in a concentration camp. He wrote, First they came for the communist, and I did not speak out, because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out, because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out, because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. El Morachamim Shochein Mamromim Ham Psei Menucha Nechona Tacha Kanfei Hashchina Vemalot Kedoshim Otorim Kezohar Kia Mazirim Et Nishmot Shisha Milyon Achenu Veachyotenu Shagru Al Kidush Hashem Baal Harachamim Yasti Rei Besetek in a Fable Olami Vitro Vitrachaim et Nishmatam Adonai Hu Nachalatam Vianuhu Bishalom Al Nishkavam Vinomar Amen. God, full of mercy, defender of widows and fathers of orphans, be not silent or restrained regarding the blood which was spilt like water. Grant proper rest beneath the wings of your presence in the great heights of the holy and pure, who like the brilliance of the heavens give light and shine for the souls of multitudes of thousands, men, women, boys, and girls, 
who were killed and slaughtered and burnt and suffocated and buried alive, all of them, holy and pure, may the Garden of Eden be their resting place, therefore. May the Master of Mercy shelter them in the shelter of his wings for eternity and bind their souls. With the bond of life, God, is their inheritance. And may they find peaceful repose in their resting place. And let us say, Amen. Amen. A prayer of resolve by Rabbi David Katz. We ask that you answer our prayers. We pray that the call of evil fall on deaf ears, that those who fight for freedom and justice always prevail, that those who need protection do not become victims. We pray that the lessons we learn from this darkest hour allow all of humanity to better itself and to truly and nobly embody the idea that we are each made in your image. We pray for the souls of the millions and millions of victims of this brutality. We pray that we honor their lives and their memories by observing this day and by doing everything in our power and beyond to make sure that no such shadow again darkens our world. Above all, we pray for shalom, for wholeness and peace to be in our midst now and forever. Please, O Holy One, answer our prayers and bring us a world devoid of hatred, filled instead with peace. May this be God's will, and may we all say together, Amen. This afternoon we remember the six million by reciting the Kaddish, the traditional Jewish prayer for the dead. This prayer is not a funeral hymn, but an affirmation of God's everlasting presence, praising God's existence and creative love. We pray the Kaddish, remembering the victims of the Holocaust. Yitgadal v'yitgadash shemei rabah, v'yalma divara kirute v'yamlik malkute. Bechayechon uviyomechon, uvchaye dechol beit Yisrael, bagala uvizman kari viimru, amen. Yehe shmei raba mevarach lealam ulme almaya, yit parach vishtabach vit paar vit ramam vit nase, vit hadar vit ale vit halal, shmei de kudisha brichu, leela min kol birchata vishirata, shirata venechemata. Da miran bi alma vi imru, amen. Yehe shalama rabba min shemaya, the chayim alenu vi al kol Yisrael vi imru, amen. O se shalom bim ramav, hu ya se shalom, alenu vi al kol Yisrael vi imru, amen. O se shalom bim ramav, hu ya se shalom ale. Enu ve al kol Yisrael v'imru v'imru amen. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu ve al kol Yisrael. Yase shalom. Yahse shalom, shalom aleinu, ve'al kol Yisrael. Green, uh, Dean Greenwald, I don't see Dalton here. Could you come and read the last uh, prayer? Oh, oh, here he is, I'm sorry. As we conclude our service, let us recall the words found on the walls of a cellar in Cologne, Germany, where Jews hid from the Nazis. I believe, I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when feeling it not. I believe in God, even when God is silent. Concludes our program. First, let me uh, join with uh, 
Professor Diner and thanking our guests, our visitors very much for really an inspiring talk and for a reminder of the importance of taking notes, uh, writing letters, um, keeping uh, archives intact um, so that uh, we always know who can tell our own stories and not rely on others to do so. What a, what a, wonderful, uh, what a wonderful legacy uh, was created uh, 80 years ago and what a leg wonderful legacy you are carrying forward now with your very sacred, sacred work. Let me thank uh, Kendra Scott Harris for being with us today, all who participated, and of course, um, you who attended um, this important Holocaust Remembrance, Warsaw Ghetto Remembrance. Uh, have a good afternoon. <laughs>